and I'll start by introducing the panelists to you. And um, the first panelist I want to introduce to you isn't here, unfortunately. <laughs> it's Klaus-Peter Rippe. And uh, many of you will know him as director of the Eidgenössische uh, Kommission für Ethik im Außerhumanbereich. Is that what it's called? So, um, unfortunately, he's ill. Um, but you find some of the publications that are relevant here um, uh, outside on the table, publication on the precautionary principle, for example, and ethical reasons for the precautionary principle. And there were also earlier in the day some copies of a very recent statement of the Commission on Gene Drives, which you can also download on their website if you like. So Christopher, you already know. Uh, we also have with us his co-author, Fern Wixen, co-author of the chapter for the report. And uh, Fern Wixen now works for the North Atlantic Marine Mammals Commission and previously worked for the Gienoch Center on Safe and Biosafety in Tromsø and has a background in uh, biology as well as uh, social sciences and uh, has worked uh, very wildly also in, in the, the interspace of policy and science in this area. And Thomas Potest also uh, is interdisciplinary by training in biology and philosophy, and, and philosophy, and he's the director of the International Center for Ethics in the Sciences and Humanities in Tübingen in Germany. So, um, welcome. And I'd like to start by um, picking up something that I think everybody here has been thinking about, but that we haven't been speaking about very much yet, and that is... Um, it, it actually was behind your first slide about there being an ethical reason uh, for the ethical challenge. Um, and, and that's the idea that uh, it might actually be possible to use uh, uh, genetic engineering and maybe gene drives in the conservation. And uh, that conservation uh, people somehow seem to uh, feel the need to position themselves in relation to this suggestion. Um, it is a slight parallel maybe with the uh, malaria case, but we're, we're on a totally different um, uh, area now, because the good would be not to sort of save lives, but to uh, uh, save biodiversity or help save biodiversity. So why uh, why, although many people in this room probably intuitively think that's a strange idea, why do we uh, tackle this idea now and need to position ourselves there? You're looking at me, so... Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I wanted to address that to you okay. first. <laughs> so I hear Kristen saying that... Um, Gene drives could be used for conservation purposes, and how do we feel about that? And isn't that a good thing if it can save biodiversity? Um, and I would just say, <laughs> we're in the middle of the sixth mass extinction right now. If you're concerned about the loss of biodiversity, be concerned right now and do something right now. You know, don't say, I need a technology that may or may not be developed effectively in the next 10 years, and perhaps that will be the saving grace. No. If land clearing, if industrial agriculture is already on a global assessment shown to be one of the major causes of this mass extinction, then do something about that and do it right now. And don't be distracted and, as Ignacio was saying, mesmerized by the promise of a technological fix to this massive problem that's already there. There are things we can be doing right now. Now you can position yourself. Uh, on the technology and how you feel about it, but I would say it's a distraction and there's things that we can all be doing right now that are much more efficient and much more effective if you care about biodiversity. So why do people in nature conservation bother to discuss it at all? I can add, I can add something. <laughs> Sorry, were you next? No, no please. Um, <laughs> so that there's this new uh, movement in conservation called compassionate conservation. Uh, and it's a response to the idea that um, ecological approaches have tended to prioritize the good of the system uh, at the expense of the good and well-being of the individual. And so there, there are some people talking about gene drives in that context 
for the possibility they might present of moving away from things like the anticoagulants that are used uh, to control rodent populations on, in island ecosystems. Um, and I think, you know, th there is an ethical argument uh, to be made in, in that context with lots of conditions on it. Okay, so that would maybe be the one that we heard earlier. Let's learn the language of nature, or speak the language of nature rather than using bulldozers and pesticides that would go in a sense for, for example, rodent control. Yeah, I mean, I would question whether a gene drive is the language of nature, uh, <laughs> but along those lines, yeah, it's a different type of uh, response to the problem, yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. Maybe, maybe I could add one idea that, that especially in, in nature conservation thinking, there is this idea that the situation is so pressing that we should use all the means possible in order to do something. And, and I think this is precisely this, this kind of instrumentalism, uh, regardless of the means, if it is for a good end, saving species, then we may use all the techniques that are on the table or will be on the table in 20 years' time. Um, and and that, that precisely needs addressing questions of priorities like, like you did. But it might also add some, some much more general questions with, which would be on the intentions level of, of your analysis, meaning that if, if you are thinking about unmanaged systems, so we are not talking about agricultural systems or forest systems, we are talking about nature conserver systems where, where nature uh, conservancy is the major uh, use. Then the question is whether, whether our general idea of conservation as non-intervention would really fit into a very technologically managerial idea of doing this kind of gene drive or other interventions. So in, in that sense, you could make a, a more general argument whether the the very idea of, of nature conservation matches with this very interventionist idea of doing uh, gene drive organisms. That's what I would call not a strong argument, but it's, it's an important argument on this level of um, what are the general values and ideas behind our efforts for nature conservation. So that means you dig deeper into the very motivation for nature conservation. You want to, what, what kind of um, motivation is that then? Is, is it related, for example, to uh, relational worldviews that were uh, mentioned before, to deep eco-philosophy, or is that independent of each other? I would say it, it is independent. You could, you could simply ask of the, the very general technological uh, question, what are our goals? What are the means? What are the consequences? And what are possible um, non-foreseeable consequences? And do these different perspectives match? Uh, so, so that's... On, on still on the level of uh, consequentialist thinking, um, asking whether the, the means to solve a problem is appropriate. And the question whether it's appropriate or not does not only uh, depend on whether you solve the problem, but also whether it fits the very background idea of what you think you are doing when you are doing conservation. So it's, it's a kind of a non-instrumentalist idea why you are looking for natural biodiversity. A non-instrumentalist idea? Yeah. So then you're looking for the biodiversity not because it serves uh, some purpose, humans for instance, but because it has an inher inherent worth or uh, um. Well, I, I was just saying, in addition to what Fan was saying, mm -hmm. you could also use this okay. more general 
perspective of, of the idea how you want to, to see nature and the instrumental means you want to deal with that. So it's not either or, it's not contradictory. Mm -hmm. It's adding a perspective, I think, and that was precisely what, what you had in mind in listing these three dimensions in the, in the report. So it's not contradictory, but it's, uh, these are several perspectives which would, in the end, uh, give, give us a much clearer picture of what might be advisable and what, what maybe not. If, 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 I, if I may um, make one comment, um, if, if it is correct that many people tend to extend the moral concerns not only to humans but also to other non-human beings, um, then of course the question is uh, what kind of, again, technological approach would fit this very idea? And I'm quite sure that eradicating populations might not be really matching this idea of morally taking care of, uh, of the rest of, of biodiversity. Eradicating species as the easy example in that context. Um, there have been proposals of um, for instance, making threatened species uh, more resistant against uh, whatever threatens them or um, uh, in some other way contributing um, to their possibility to survive. Um, <clears throat> in that case, if, if it turned out that the means was appropriate in that particular moment, sort of um, in that particular case, would, it, would you still have the possibility to, on a general basis, say that you think it sort of doesn't address the right question, or um, I mean, because that that is how it is being presented to us, isn't that that there is potential to uh, to not eradicate, but to uh, to uh, actually uh, help in conservation in some way, and that we're doing management. Of nature anyway, and that this is that we cannot sort of just um, uh, reject a potential method. I'm trying to get at where where the where the um, uh, where where the um, thing that you want to uh, reply to this is based. So um, you're saying it doesn't fit. Um, does it not fit because it doesn't address the right thing, or does it not fit because there is something more generally debatable about it? Um, but I think that those things are probably also um, complementary rather than. Um, but but uh, I would like to hear a little bit more about those possibilities. I mean, I think we have to be really careful not to stray into this kind of speculative ethics where we get into a point of saying, if you could develop a gene drive to support the resistance of a threatened population, would you accept it then? I feel, I find that kind of a question quite trapping in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm certainly not someone who, I don't, I'm not really in favor of universalized principles or or things like that. I'm much more context-based. I want to know exactly what type we're talking about, for what use, for what purpose, in what context before I take my decision about whether it's desirable or not. So I'm not going to sit here and say all gene drives are uh, unacceptable on principle. That's not my kind of approach. Mm -hmm. But I also don't believe in kind of giving really speculative potential possible maybe ifs and would you then say yes I'm all for that. I find that it, it, it's very, it's sort of a leading question. And I think when you look at what the conservation examples are of gene drive research, they are eradication. They're eradication of invasive species on islands. That's where the actual research is taking place. So it's still about eradicating populations, maybe not species, but populations mm -hmm. on islands. And often uh, through things like engineering sterility. And for me, that is ethically a very, um, dangerous territory to stray into, to engineer a, sp a species or a population to spread sterility 
that is so against what evolution is all about, really, and what life is about. Life is about uh, reproduction, and and to engineer something to be sterile. It seems um, I have an, an intuition, a gut feeling that that is uh, unethical. And I could give you all the kinds of arguments for that, but all those arguments would stem from that gut feeling of that's a, a, a radical violation of what life on this planet, what makes life on this planet so amazing and so incredible. So when I look at the concrete examples of what gene drives are used in for conservation purposes, it's about eradication through sterility. And that feels uh, unethical to me. If, if I may jump in. Um, I agree. I, I would add that the sterility argument has a very strong a dimension also in the classical risk assessment. Um, and I want to bring home one point, So, and, and I could make this point now. Uh, I have to please forget about the word speculative ethics. My esteemed colleague Alfred Nordmann got it completely wrong <laughs> in the wording, not, not in the the way he, what, what he was saying. But the wording, speculative ethics, is engineering of um, the wrong way to look at ethics. Because it's not the ethics that's speculative. It's the speculative technocratic optimism that then is put into ethical deliberation. So it's not speculative ethics. It's speculative technocratic optimism. And only then ethics is coming in. So I think Alfred was really hitting on the wrong head here. It's not the, I mean, there are lots of ethicists who do this kind of, you know, uh, uh, um, things like what if and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but the major thing is um, this, this speculation is resting on technocratic optimism and not on ethics. And I really want to hammer out that point here, um, that it's not about ethics, but, but of the very idea that we think, OK, what would the world be if you know, all our technological devices would work without any fault? And this is precisely, and people, other people have addressed it as well, that is precisely the trap um, you got into when you say, well, let's think if this malaria eradication would work, how could you possibly be against it? Well, you have to get, you have to step back. And this is what, you know, many people and, and on many pages of that report has been, has been done. So I'm silent now. I think I could make my point. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um point about, about the term as well. Uh, I think it has become quite popular uh, uh, also in technology assessment. It has become quite popular because the paper uh, uh, struck such an important point and, and many people, uh, I think, on reading it at the time realized that, oh, wow, yeah, we might be sort of instrumentalized for uh, creating some sort of habituation or acceptance by talking ethics about something. Uh, and so it, it is a very important a point, but actually maybe the wording doesn't I, serve it very well. <laughs> I, I have a suggestion which was coined by the founding director of our ethics center, Dietmar Mead. He is talking about the, the normative power of the fictional, um, even the normative power of the counterfactual. And I think that's precisely the point, that, that you, you get this normative moral power from fictional ideas about possible states of the world and the technology we are using. So it's a, an appeal to stay uh, in reality, which we've heard before, and, and in the here and now. Uh, so... Um, yeah, and just to elaborate that yeah. in the malaria case, because we're being told, if this is developed and if it can save, how can you be against it, right? Mm -hmm. Now, at the same time, we have these deaths, we have this problem, we know there are things we can do, and we're not 
doing all that we could do because it's a, it's a, as Ching was saying, it's a, it's a poor problem in a way. And we're not working in every way we can to eradicate poverty. So you can say, you're already <laughs> being unethical because we have this problem. And it's not when you don't accept the future technology that you've got an ethical dilemma. It's right now. It's right now because you're not doing all you can right now. So we know that 90% of the deaths from malaria are in Africa and two thirds of those in children under the age of five. Now I can guarantee you that if 90% of the deaths were in Boston and the two-thirds of them were men between the ages of 20 and 40, the problem would be solved already and we wouldn't need to wait for a, a hypothetical technology in 10 years. I'm really glad that this is being exercised here because it is really frequent that you get put into that uh, dilemma type situation. So the main message so far is step back and, and, uh, and uh, be willing to criticize the question, right? And, and look at, uh, criticize the question in terms of what is going on in the world right now, <clears throat> but also criticize the question in terms of the, the layer at which the question is asked. So uh, when you were talking about uh, using a, ge a gene drive to save a species hypothetically, um, I was thinking of the, um, uh, the honey creeper species in Hawaii and the avian malaria um, and the possibility of, of um, a gene drive that would help the honey creepers. Um, so you can ask the question at that level where the, the different honey creeper species are the issues. Or you can ask the question at the level of uh, designer ecosystems or designer genomes. And it, it, that is to come at it from a completely different angle. It's to focus your ethical intention on a different place. Uh, and quite possibly, you might come up with a different answer. Um, so the, the importance of paying attention to context uh, it is relevant, not just in terms of the context of the sort of real world situation, but also in terms of the context of the level at which the question is, is being developed and asked. So you mentioned uh, uh, context such as socioeconomic context in your report. Um, and you, there's, there's one thing that I wonder, when we talk about it now, we, we do have the gene drive topic in the center, right? We're not starting at a particular problem uh, we're talking about, uh, but the particular problem is a policy challenge problem somehow, isn't it? That's, that's what we're addressing here now. So that's why we're putting it in the center. Um, is it at all uh, advisable to have uh, ethics discussions about it then? Or are we, are we in the middle of that process of uh, normalizing the idea? And, uh, and this is related to something that's been said several times about the need to get, uh, get the uh, people on board and get people informed, have participation and engagement. Mm. Is, is the level of engagement that is necessary uh, the, the level where you focus on, the, uh, on informing about and discussing the ethics of a particular technology? Or uh, is even that already a step uh, in in a sort of biased direction? Uh, maybe Christopher wants to say? Uh, I'm not clear on the question, I'm afraid. Mm, is putting the technology and the ethics discussion about the technology in the focus, is that already a step in a sort of biased direction rather than uh, stepping back and uh, asking what the problem is? Is, I, that was maybe uh, a question maybe, for maybe, yeah. I, I, maybe I have an idea <laughs> yeah. what your question points at, uh, which is that um, it, I, I remember one parallel case with regard to, to geoengineering. When there was a debate in, in German um, academic um, field, also within colleagues in ethics, asking, okay, the, the People said, if we, if we do research on geoengineering, um, the, this whole idea receives an academic dignity that it doesn't deserve, so to speak. 
but but this is but that's I think that's a question of political communication of strategy and tactics, um, and being in the position of 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 a university researcher and teacher, I'm I'm not sure whether my specific role is to judge upon the proper strategy and tactics in political communication on issues. So we, I think we have two dimensions of that. Mm. Are we reinforcing some more or less problematic things by jumping on them? Um, but on the other hand, I think we have good reasons also as, as ethicists to reflect on technologies like geoengineering or gene drives, uh, etc. So, so the I understand the, the the charge that once you talk about it, you normalize it. Um, on the other hand, I would say it's precisely what I see my role um, to think about that, to to raise critical questions, um, because that's on another level than the political and strategic question whether it's good to you know reinforce this um, and, and on, on that political question uh, level I have no idea I, I'm, I really I don't have any idea um, I we have been discussing that also with regard to to uh, the question of uh, using the gene drives and, and other novel uh, genetic technologies in conservation, uh, but as as you know, uh, it's out there. It's out there in IUCN documents, and in that case, uh, you have to say something about it. Yeah. So uh, how <laughs> how did it get into IUCN documents? Um, I don't know if that's an ethical question. Um, would you like to say something about that? Process? I don't know how it got into IUCN documents, but I, I think if you're talking about if talking about something normalizes it, then then let's be strategic about what conversations we have and who we have them with, right? What do we want to normalize? So I've done a lot of my ethics work uh, with scientists, where I hang out in labs and I talk to scientists and we work together to reflect on the work that they do and the technologies that they develop and, and how that can be done in, in a good, responsible way. Now, if me talking to scientists about ethics is normalizing ethical reflection in the laboratory, great, I'm all for that, let's do that. Do you know what I mean? Uh, talking about ethics about a, of a technology that not yet developed to the media in the public, now that's normalizing something different, in a different way, in a different community. So I think the fact that you talk about something and normalize it can be used strategically to bring about more responsible and sustainable science. Uh, for example, by normalizing ethical reflection amongst uh, scientists working on emerging technologies. Um, uh, so what about engaging the public? Uh, for instance, in Germany there has in the last uh, three years been a series of uh, public engagement activities by the Leopoldina where uh, uh, the topic is gene editing, genome editing. Uh, there, there were a variety of topics. One was um, uh, uh, ca cancer therapy, I think, and the other was uh, uh, um, the fight against malaria. Uh, and it was constructed as, for example, um, debates uh, where you get uh, sort of in some input and then and then uh, the audience uh, is asked to debate the pros and cons that that would be i think uh, maybe you know an example of of another kind of normalization um, and maybe we need to engage uh, with that uh, in specific ways so Brian Wynn, who was moderating one of the earlier sessions, has made a distinction between invited and uninvited engagement. And I think this is a really powerful conceptual division in the sense of when we're talking about engaging the public and we, we kind of invite them to attend certain events that we put together and we decide who's on the panel and we decide what questions are asked and we decide what happens with the input, we being whoever is the organiser. Um, 
There's all kinds of challenges and problems with that. Whereas uninvited engagement is what the kids striking on the streets are doing in a way. No one's inviting them in to have a conversation about how we should handle climate change. They're just goddamn expressing their opinion. And that's what we saw early in the GMO debate as well. It was uninvited, it was unruly. I'm not gonna say disruptive, <laughs> but it was being framed in many different ways by people using their own ways of framing, understanding their own agendas, forcing in a way their own position and their own way of interacting with this issue, which is a very different way for publics to engage than being invited into a very structured and very manufactured kind of space. Now, both may have their role and both may be important, but I think that we absolutely have to see the value of those kind of unruly and uninvited forms of engagement and we can ask why isn't that yet happening around GDOs and that's because there are so many other pressing issues on the agenda right now but the, it is happening around biodiversity loss and it is happening around climate um, that people are self-organizing self-framing and having something to say about it but if, if we go away from the issues that are sort of more, um, how did you say it, uh, speculative uh, technocratic optimism, uh, there are also some issues uh, that are uh, scary even without technocratic optimism, such as the thought that there might be uh, things being developed even though, you know, it might not yet f function very well, but there's dual use potential, there's military interests, uh, there are or maybe just uh, commercial interests strong enough to push things on the agenda more than anticipated and one has to be ready with some sort of regulatory approach to this. Uh, how, can, how can ethical uh, perspectives uh, help there? Part of my uh, motivation to be in this conversation um, in my work is that uh, it's very tempting with a new technology, if, you, if you're on the development side of new technology, to say um, this is nothing really different. Uh, we've been doing this since, you know, agriculture uh, or, you know, this, this is just a continuation of previous um, uh, developments. Um, I think sometimes you, you can say, no, no, this is different. Uh, this is metabolic. So I use the idea of a, a metabolism and interfering with the Earth's metabolism. Um, this raises the ethical questions to a new level. Um, and, you know, I think that one of the interesting things about the climate change activism at the moment is this sort of recognition that things are at a different level now. Um, you know, they are planetary, they are multi-generational. Um, they're important in, in a way that, uh, I mean, yes, there have been important issues before, but this, this is a, a different type of importance. And I think the, uh, the biodiversity report just a couple of weeks ago um, was a good attempt to uh, bring that biodiversity conversation uh, to the same level that the climate conversation has been. Um, and so I think it, it's totally legitimate to say uh, we need to be more alert right now. This is a, a more important issue uh, that, that needs more engagement than some issues have had before. If, if, if I may um, answer the question, what, what could be the role of of ethics uh, here, um, I, I would agree with the idea that that one point really is to to make clear that already within technology uh, there's lots of lots of moral uh, values and and implications. Um, second, that um, and and this I think this is very important um, that. Um, at least we as moral philosophers um, are not experts on moral questions. We are experts, uh, experts on moral theory. So if you come to me and have, have a moral problem, I'm not the one to tell you what to do. That's, you know, counter everything what has been in, in, in Western moral philosophy for the last uh, 2,000 years, 2,500 years. But that again makes clear that moral questions are questions of everyone. So everyone is thinking about whether, some, whether an action is bad or good, whether something is moving into a wrong or the right direction. Uh, and everyone, and I'm, I'm, I'm completely old-fashioned enlightenment here, 
um, talking about morals means that, that everybody uses his or her capacity uh, for judging. And, and our role as, as professional ethicists is contributing some more technical knowledge like the people from biology or social sciences are contributing their technical knowledge. So if anybody is interested in the difference between rule-based utilitarianism and act-oriented utilitarianism, uh, we can have a coffee over that. Um, and, and the interesting point is, at, at which situation do we need this kind of specific moral philosophy expertise in how deep um, um, mining into these issues, uh, and, and that's precisely the same question as how much information from the science and technology studies, uh, in, in how fine-grained information do we need this in order to have a societal debate on questions like gene drives. Uh, and, and, and this is maybe um, the, the point where the public debate needs an idea of what role expertise could play and what role expertise could not play. And, and I would say that relates to the natural sciences, to the social sciences, to philosophy, to whatever, um, equally. And, and we might be or we should be asked by uh, the people who are doing the deliberation and the political uh, decisions um, of what we could contribute. So in, in that sense, uh, our role is not, uh, like as you said, is not to organize the, the discourse, but, but to respond and bring in these kind of, of uh, dimensions of reflection. I just wanted to say I really appreciate what Thomas is saying there, that ethics is not a domain for experts. I mean, we can sit here and, and and, and be given an extra space in the floor to have something to say about this. But deciding on what is right and wrong and reflecting on what is right and wrong is indeed something everybody does uh, almost all the time in one way or another. But I think that the role of ethics, you know, in, in the world right now is really about uh, waking up to the way that we are shaping this planet and shaping life on this planet and not sitting on the sofa and allowing things to just roll and assume that things are just gonna always be the way they are and we have no power and we have no ability to change, to sit there and ask yourself, what kind of a future do you want? What kind of impacts are your actions having? How could I imagine a positive future? What would I need to do to get there? So that you ethics as a role is making you reflect on the future and help you realize that you are guiding and steering that all of your actions and all of the little things that you do, all the purchases you make, what food that you eat, all of that is co-shaping the life on the planet and ethics is inviting you to reflect on that and what is good and what is bad and what kind of future you want and your own role in shaping that future rather than just allowing the world to sort of unfold without you realizing um, the way you're shaping it and ethics has that role of asking us to sit back and say what do you really want what do you think is good and how can we get there so it has been for, I think, 20 years or so now, a standard requirement that uh, ethical, legal, and social aspects for such reasons are taken into account in research and also in, in addressing scientists as experts for policy. Uh, and uh, there has been a lot of activity in these areas. Uh, and uh, at the same time, it can seem sometimes that maybe it, uh, there's room to fill it with even more content in terms of what can actually then be addressed in a policy setting uh, of these uh, ethical, legal and social uh, aspects. And I'm, I'm thinking of, of the way you opened up, uh, uh, and I'm also thinking of uh, uh, what Thomas has been working a lot on, uh, um, uh, with you call them moral epistemic hybrids. So, so you're saying uh, there is often in a particular uh, concept already an element of uh, science as well as an element of of uh, value. Uh, I don't know if that's how you would put it, but maybe you could tell us a little bit more about how that can be relevant in something like um, looking at regulation, risk assessment, precaution. Um, uh, how, how ethical theory uh, sort of fills in uh, content there. 
um, <laughs> my, my, my point is that when, when looking at, um, at debates in uh, both around genetic engineering and biodiversity 20 years ago, um, I, I found that, that still the idea was that um, many people thought biodiversity is something which biologists are experts for. But if you, if you look to the way uh, this term has been framed in, in politics and also in the sciences, um, I, I made the claim that, that biodiversity as a concept uh, was, was not only owned by biologists, because it was a concept that already assumed that there is an issue with extinction, uh, with you know, nature uh, being on a, on a, a deterioration path. And, and so in that sense, um, my idea was that also in the very core of the idea of biodiversity, already value aspects have been um, in place. Uh, and vice versa, that um, you couldn't do ethics without assuming structures of the world which are informed by social sciences and natural sciences. So, so in that sense, uh, my, my first uh, approach was to see um, that the, the knowledge base um, is already very much integrated. So the separation between factual knowledge and values is much more blurred than we thought, which is not to say that everything um, is, you know, just messy. Uh, you can say more about that, uh, but that would also that would also help to f to frame public debates in different ways. Not to say, okay, here are the experts for the facts. Uh, and on the other side are the values, and we live in a pluralist society, so the values are shaky and, you know, problematic, but the facts are really straightforward. Uh, and I was trying to challenge this idea um, that we also, and I mean, this is really nothing new, um, that, that also on, on how we, we describe systems um, scientifically, natural scientifically, um, is resting on assumptions which come from natural, from philosophy of nature, which are not always neutral, also in the moral sense. And this is precisely what, what I also read in, in your report on, on, on different parts, uh, that, this, that this integration of different perspectives is very important, first of all, to understand what we are talking about. Um, and then maybe... Uh, and again, this is, you know, old-fashioned enlightenment ideas, uh, in better understanding um, constellations, we might also make better decisions. So um, we could open for questions from the audience. There's one right there. Do we have microphones? Sorry, I, I'm, I was too quick with this now. <laughs> I can just try and speak up. Yeah. Oh, no, for the translation, we need you to wait for the uh, mic. Who first? Right behind you. Thank you. Uh, before, we had various people from the audience make, trying to make the point that uh, how can we bring the debate to the people, to the individual, and while I completely agree with that aspect, that part, I think that maybe it's also a sign of our times that we think first and foremost of the individual and not of, not of the responsibility of our culture. And so my question is, and I already posed it to, um, sorry, to Christopher, <laughs> and I'd be interested what you, your two responses would be is, how can we involve those groups and those sources of our culture that have traditionally, up until maybe a generation ago, been kind of the source of ethic ethical, not in a sense of whether it actually is, but at least in the sense of ethical deliberation, namely religion. Why are religions so silent 
on this topic. I mean, a woman that I was talking before mentioned that the Pope apparently did make a statement about that, but in general, they're absent in this debate. So my question is, shouldn't there be an effort to involve religion into this debate? That sounds like you've given yourself a task, and I say, go for it. <laughs> Looking, my personal experience in, in Germany, or more specifically, West Germany, but that also relates to, to the Eastern part, is that, that many debates on, on GMOs, early debates, uh, have been pushed very much by specific groups also from from the Catholic and the Protestant churches. So in, in that sense, I, I would, wouldn't agree completely with the idea that, that some of, of the re, uh, religiously uh, inclined people haven't been uh, um, operational in this, in this debate. Uh, however, I mean, that, that brings us to a very important point. Um, what, what role um, religious faith could play in a society which at least uh, on the programmatic level uh, seems to be secular or wants to be secular, which is not true to many also Western societies right now. Um, but anyway, um, and, and I think there are, that's very much on, on this motivational level um, where you could ex ask these very general question of, of what is the relation between humans and the rest of the, the world and, and things like that. Um, however, if it, if it comes to legislation, um, maybe it's not that uh, good to, to you know, refer very much to, to this kind of re uh, religious faith because that's sectoral. And, and I'm, yeah, anyway, let's put it like that. And, and even, even with this widely received uh, Laudato Si um, um, document of, of the Pope, uh, that had very few repercussions within the Catholic Church, as I have been informed by people who know about that. And if you, if you look to that, my criticism of, of this is, of this encyclica is, that it very much on the one hand, criticizes capitalism, but then brings back the responsibility to act on the individual. That has to do with religious ideas of, you know, uh, people, you know, being sinners and, and everything like that. Um, and, and I'm not sure about that. I, I think we should, we have to get away with the idea that it's mainly the individual that has, you know, to change the world. We, we need much more debates on, on political e economy and political ecology and, and all these sorts than asking, okay, what, now, I'm, I'm not saying this is unimportant, but if you focus too much on the individual, then it's getting wrong. And maybe some aspects of religion maybe is focusing too much on the individual. That, that was a long and windy comment. Sorry for being so imprecise. I actually thought it was very interesting. I don't know if the entire audience has actually read uh, this, uh, what was it I'm called? <laughs> Would you mind just telling us in a few sentences a little bit more about the content and then we go to the next question? Uh, well, as, as, as a Protestant, uh, <laughs> being, being, being raised, being raised in, oh, anyway, um, <laughs> no, it's the, 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 the encyclica uh, Laudato Si has been, has been very informative because it's addressing issues of climate change, of, of environmental degradation in a very strict sense, and especially addressing that this problem is related to the way how, let's say, neoliberal capitalism has been shaping the world. Uh, and so in that sense, it, it was very um, important and has been enthusiastically taken up by people uh, to say, well, then now we have support from the Catholic Church uh, with our agendas for um, uh, climate policy and, and the critique of, of um, growth societies and something like that. And there is very much uh, into it. 
Um, but allow me to make one comment. Um, the word e ecology has been coined by a German uh, biologist who in 1906 was uh, declared the counter-pope, um, which has some irony in it. Um, mainly the, the idea that um, ecology itself could be something like, you know, a worldview uh, which is not related to religion, but which is taking over the very idea of religion. And this is precisely what Ernst Haeckel and his monism was trying to do 100 years ago. Uh, but I'm, I'm, you know, going astray right now. I'm sorry for that. But we have to be clear that if we, if we, if we, if we tackle these very general issues of worldviews, uh, we have interesting connections and contradictions on, on that level. So things are not getting easier, uh, which also is something which philosophers like to bring in uh, in analyzing things, uh, making it more complicated in the end. But that's our job. We have the next question here, and then two more in the back. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. It's Helena Paul from EcoNexus. This is a very broad question, but I would like to know how and where we can best tackle this mindset that we've been talking about that seeks to precipitate us towards gene drives and geoengineering. The how do you change society questions are the questions that can be, uh, uh, the answers can go on forever. <laughs> you know, that they are the impossible questions, right? Um, how do you change society? I mean, there's a dy an internal dynamic and an external dynamic. There's elements of societal change that are uncontrollable, unpredictable. Um, there's places each of us can engage where we think it's important. So, you know, I teach intro to ethics to a lot of students who are not philosophy students. They might be biologists or uh, forestry students. And you know, really one of my, my main goals is, is to persuade them that ethics is in their day from the moment they crawl out of bed in the morning. Uh, and and if, they, if they learn that at the end of the semester, you know, I feel like I've done something. Um, so, of course, I'm not changing society myself, but that's the place I engage. Uh, and I don't think there's a, a, a clear or singular answer to the question about, yeah. How do you change mindsets? I mean, I agree with Christopher. I, I, I want to give the mic to everyone else on the floor. But um, I mean, for me, to change a mindset, you have to change concepts, which requires that you change language. So even the, the, the notion of a human, to me, is uh, that, that's in need of reworking. You know, now that we know that we're, we're in, there are more bacterial cells in this package of skin than there are human cells. I mean, what does that mean for the concept of a human? We know we're deeply interdependent. We're co-arising through relation. I mean, what do we mean? What, what purpose is that concept of the human being serving anymore? We need new language. We need new words. We need new ways of uh, thinking. And if you have new ways of thinking, you need new concepts. And for new concepts, you need new language. Um, so I, that's why I get excited by some of these sort of writers like Liker or Hater, Donna Haraway, plays with language and just kind of throws different uh, terms into the way she speaks so that you have to think about what does that mean? What could that mean? How do I see the world when that term that you just created is in front of me? Uh, and so Thich Nhat Hanh has also talked about interbeing. You know, and the, the way that shifts your mindset, if we weren't here talking about how we have to save the humans from dying from malaria, but we have to think about what kind of interbeings we're becoming, it, it, it shifts everything, right? So I think this kind of, um, we need new concepts and for that we need new language. And we need to play with that and find ones that work to create new, new mindsets and new views. Yes, I absolutely. Oops, <laughs> I absolutely agree with that. And I think that that's one of the things that uh, is important to think about is how transdisciplinary kinds of debates can perhaps lead us in different directions, uh, particularly in recognizing ourselves as a species. And if you look at like cultural studies, you have all this incredible analysis of um, like, for example, the Zulus believe that mother nature's a, a shapeshifter, that you know we're part of her. Um, I think we have to start to look at those things and also the intervention that cultural 
Uh, in, in cultural studies, you find out about, like, for example, you know, there is an intervention in forests of burning in order to regenerate Aboriginal people that have been doing it for millions of years. So I think we have to think about intervention as well, but I think that's the grappling. We want to intervene, but we also want to recognise ourselves as part of everything. And this becomes a little bit of a paradox, no? So the question I have is um, really how do we um, think again about Chris Barr in relation to the fact that where 70% of the species loss is really due to the fact that we're the dominant species? You know, do, can we think of this kind of gene drive idea in relation to those big sorts of questions? It, um, maybe I could look for some disagreement. Um, and, and I would, would say if, if we think about ourselves as humans, yeah. I would be very hesitant to talk about us as a species. Yeah. Because to me, a species is, is, a, is a biological concept. And, and the idea of humankind is much more richer than, than the biological idea of Homo sapiens. So, so in that sense, I'm also at odds with this charge of speciesism, which you know emerged by Peter Singer in Animal Ethics and in, in, in other ways by in Bruno Latour or, or Donna Haraway's writings. And, and I think it's 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 a misinterpretation of the way we are talking about ourselves. Um, if we are talking about Homo sapiens as a species, we could do that, you know, through the lens of ecology and, and interaction and, and find out all sorts of things. But we, if we are talking, who is we? Well, if human people are talking about <laughs> humanity and, and fellow humans, there is a much more richer context, and which, which may not be reduced to the species issue. There is history, there is culture and everything else which I would not subsume under this species idea. So again, that would be shifting the frame. So let, let's be cautious in talking about the species of humans being the problem for other species. Uh, maybe we should reframe that in a, in a different way, uh, also in order to ensure that responsibility still remains with humans, period. No other beings. Even, even if they are fellows or, or you know, co, uh, co-inhabiting uh, our bodies. Would you like to respond to that, Fern? You, you sort of look uh, itchy. <laughs> uh, I, uh, even if you keep the species yeah. kind of line, I mean, I, I hear what Thomas is saying and I appreciate that, but even if you say, I, I want to work with the concept of a species, I think it's interesting to reflect on, okay, what kind of a species are we? You know, how, how if we were like uh, aliens or something external looking down at the earth, how would we see humanity? And, you know, we, we often think of ourselves as superior, as somehow exceptional, you know, as, as primary, as the top of the chain or whatever. Uh, and yet a lot of the actions that I see are kind of like a virus, you know, or a, or a parasite, you know, something that's killing its host. You know, or, or a virus, we're getting inside something, switching its genes around to manufacture something that suits us for our own purposes, and then we kill that off and move on to the next thing. Or Do, do you know what I mean? If you start to think about what, what kind of a species are we? I mean, I think the concept of the species, because it's biological, can help you separate a little bit from, from you know, your cultural understandings or whatever and see what are we doing in the world and what other species do the kinds of things that we do and how does that make us feel about what we're doing? Uh, I'd like to ask a kind of a practical NGO question in the end. But first, my assumption of, and you put it quite nicely with the uh, Heckel as the, as the counter-pope, and I would say, uh, uh, Laudato Si is probably now the Jesuits' uh, adaptation <laughs> of uh, ecology being and ethical guidance, right? And that is 
an important question. Would beyond the um, ethical paradigm that uh, nothing is more important than to prevent human suffering and, uh, and enable individual human survival uh, to the limit, right? Which so far I think is the fundamental ethical demand, right? This is what we're tackling with when we talk about uh, malaria. There is nothing Nothing more uh, ethical, nothing, there is no higher moral imperative than to prevent humans from suffering and save human lives, right? And that seems to contradict in, 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 in many ways with an, an ethic of ecology, of ecological adaptation, and so on and so forth. And uh, I think the ethical challenge at this moment or the challenge for the profession of ethicists probably is also to uh, try, try and bring these two um, um, paradigms or ethical uh, demands in some kind or into some kind of dialogue and balance, right? There's this, uh, I mean, the cynical ethical conclusion is the best thing for Mother Earth would be if this human species died out quickly, right? That would save more other species than anything else. That would save the planet, right? That's the, the kind of, yeah, everybody has that somewhere in his back head. And then we are talking about this techno-ethics, right? Which you criticized to be dubbed as, as, as uh, speculative ethics. But I think we need speculative ethics or this what-if type of ethics simply as a result of the, the, the highest speed of conversion of, from idea to technology to reality. If we don't, if we don't have a, an ethical answer to hypothetical questions, we will already be too late, right? If we want to uphold a precautionary approach, we can't get away without what if questions. That's, that's my feeling. We're under this kind of ethical emergency um, tension, right? And then the ultimate ethical question, I, I think that lingers in the whole, in this whole, um, 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 gene drive uh, debate obviously is, now as we as a species have caused climate uh, change, have caused a decline of biodiversity, have caused an ecological state of emergency, are we not obliged to help poor other co-creatures to adapt to the mess we have created? So that's right? uh, so that that would ask if if there was a gene drive that could save uh, a species from going extinct, not by killing its predator, its invasive predator, but but by enabling the species to adapt to a too rapidly changing uh, climatic and biodiversity uh, uh, environment. Would we not be obliged to do this for, because we are the ones who have caused the, the, the problem, right? Would you like to respond to that, Christopher? Yeah, very, very briefly, um, I, I was going to add to uh, Thomas's discussion of Laudato Si. One of the major things that did is it uh, put an, an argument for biocentrism and ecocentrism into Christian theology as opposed to anthropocentrism. Major breakthrough. Um, to, to make that shift from anthropocentrism to a biocentrism or ecocentrism uh, is a major shift. Um, the field I work in, environmental philosophy, um, I was strategic when I chose my area of philosophy. I went to the field that had only been going for 40 years, so I didn't have to read 2,000 years of uh, philosophical history or more. Um, but in those 40 years, uh, the, the field began with this very same question. What would a biocentric or an ecocentric ethic look like? Uh, and that is, it is an ongoing project. 
uh, as important today as it was 40 years ago. Um, so it's not that it, 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 in part of the, the way your question was being asked, uh, it sort of sounded like this is a, a, a new um, ethical challenge we must confront, uh, but it, it's been the ethical challenge that has motivated the field of environmental ethics for the whole of its existence. If, if I may respond to that, um, um, I think if you frame the question as an emergency question, like, you know, I'm lying here and bleeding, and, you know, why would no one come with, with taping, you know, the wound, um, then maybe you lose um, lots of the context of posing the question. So I think if we, if we are discussing moral issues in this em emergency help situation, uh, most of the people would feel obliged to answer, of course, we have to do everything what we can. However, as, as you have been uh, also alluding to, uh, we are much more in, in the situation, even in, in emergency situation, that, that people have been um, characterized as triage, which is a deeply military issue. You know, that you have uh, uh, 500 people uh, being close to, to dying, and you have to make the decision whom you are going to help first. This is also what Norman Mayers almost 40 years ago has been publishing in a book on, on uh, species extinction, the, the book, uh, the, the Sinking Ark. I mean, you have, one has to be very critical about that. But he was asking the question, okay, we, we can't save all the species, the non-human species, at the same time. So we have to make some priorities. And there are all these debates on priority in species conservation in biodiversity hotspots and what have you. And now this question um, brings you out of a situation which is framed in this immediate, okay, we have to do anything we can. Because we have to make more broader decisions in the context of our resources, of the time and, and everything else. And so we need this kind of of priority setting, which is not very nice, um, which brings us into into ethical uh, uh, dilemmata, um, because we, we you know we can't do everything at the same time, um, but but in order to do so, we really need to kind of pool this information, and then there would be another debate. Um, I think if we think about our own humanity as a mainly negative force on Earth, we are framing us in the wrong way. Because it's, you know, a very pessimistic, it's, it's anti-humanist. Anti and there are, you know, quite some indications that that's not completely wrong. But again, that would not be, um, I think, the basis for, for proper action. Identifying our fellow humans as pests of Mother Earth, I think will, will lead us not to very good points in making decisions. Following up on uh, what Benedict Allen said, I humbly uh, contradict uh, Thomas Potas in his view of humanity as the special humanity. And uh, I'd rather go with Fern, uh, Vic, Vic, uh, whatever. Um, <laughs> in the new uh, sort of strategic book of the Club of Rome, in English called Come On, and in German, Wir sind dran. First, we analyze the Anthropocene and say, this is a disaster, a total disaster for nature. And then we go on and demand no less than a new enlightenment that overcomes the anthropocentric enlightenment which stemmed from the empty world when things were not so bad. 
But in the full world, we cannot afford sticking to the anthropocentric worldview. We have to do, uh, I mean, uh, somebody said a new mindset. Good enough, but uh, a new enlightenment is a lot stronger. And there we say, we need more balance, including between humans and nature. Now we are totally out of balance. We give one figure, one mathematical figure. If you count the body weights of vertebrates on Earth in three categories, you find that 30% uh, of the body weights of vertebrates are humans on Earth. 67% of the body weights are our animals, essentially for slaughter, for our eating. Remains 3% for wild living animals. This is the Anthropocene. It's the end of wild animals. So uh, we better go for a radical uh, new understanding of humans and nature. Was this a statement primarily? Or did you want? <laughs> I, I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Excuse me. Do you want to respond? This new enlightenment is based on an argumentation which is precisely the argumentation of the classical old enlightenment. We, we have analyzed things properly, we have identified figures. Uh, we have, you know, put moral concerns. Uh, so I, sorry for that, <laughs> but but I think we don't need a new enlightenment. Let's let's take the old enlightenment seriously, uh, and and we would be on precisely on the same track. So we well we have just this one more question for now, but there will be a, a chance to chat after the closing of the symposium. So this is the last question from the audience, then I have one tiny last question to you, and then uh, that's it for today. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Christian. I want to come back just to your question from the beginning. Can um, genome editing contribute to the loss of diversity? Right? Okay, <laughs> and I want to answer with a clear no. It can't <laughs> because the, it is not. The, it doesn't. It would not tackle the problem because the problem. We know the problem, and let me see, uh, say again: it's um, um, the intensive industrial agriculture with deforestation for animal food, with grassland change, and with the use of um, fertil chemical fertilizers and pesticides. And we, in, that, this is not an ethical question. It, we just has to, have to stop it. And the ethical question, in my point, comes on that point, where goes the money? For example, on the University of Tübingen, where you are. Um, so I think most of the money goes to genetic engineering, breeding, for example for cultivated, for agricultural plants, yeah? But what goes to organic plant breeding, which suits to this system with low input, yeah? I think there's nearly nothing. And this should be discussed, yeah? Where does the money go in Germany, from the uh, Deutsche Forschung, DFG, <laughs> and also on the European Union level? So this is yeah, a question need, on the yeah, just so allocation. This is a question, yeah. if you could please, Order. Where do you discuss these points? The just allocation of funding. Yeah. May I just want to say it's, it's in the social issues part of the report. The, the, the discussion, like where, where is the, that discussed? It's in the social issues chapter of the report. That was a brief response. And, uh, no, I mean, that, I, seriously, you want, I mean, yeah? um, we, we live in a pluralist world, so strong deontological statements that something is morally good or morally bad are critical. But with regard to the question of industrial farming and meat consumption of the rich parts of the world, um, the, the ethical judgment is pretty clear that this is not sustainable, this is not in accord with uh, animal welfare, this is not in accord with anything we hold up as values. So in that sense, uh, we si simply have a political power problem 
but not an ethical problem, so to speak. Sorry for that. So there is consensus. And then we are talking about allocation of money in, in the research uh, arena. And everything you said uh, was right, except that in Tübingen the money goes to artificial intelligence right now. Uh, and, and that would be a new debate of allocation of funds. So I'm, I'm completely on your side. Um, and we are addressing these issues in, in different fora, but I, again, this is not a question of an, um, an, an academic ethical discourse. That is a question of a political power game within the sciences, in, in, in politics, and in, in society uh, at, at large. And, and we have to discuss that, I think, mainly on the societal level. Um, there was one last question here that I'd missed, so we're going to hear that. Okay, um, thank you uh, for the debate. I just want to uh, um, try to formulate my question. Um, I want to uh, reinsert for a moment the economic issue because we mentioned it some, somehow uh, 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 also in the precedent uh, debate and uh, we speak about the economy and the fact that uh, uh, these kind of te technologies are a sort of uh, technological fix to environmental degradation. But I think there is also another kind of fix which is going on and this is the fix about economic accumulation because we didn't mention the, the, the basic economic issue which um, frame capitalist economy which is accumulation and so the imperative uh, to growth. So my question which is maybe, uh, uh, um, so my question to you is how um, do you make the link between growth and this kind of technologies? And just to, put, to, precise, to precise my question, the, the point for me is that uh, um, uh, this kind of fix or technological fix are not, is what we are saying, they are not really a sol make a solution to the environmental issues which really affect in growth to one side and to the other side we cannot um, uh, we, we, we cannot forget the uh, uh, economic side of this kind of technologies and the fact that we are in a, living in an economic crisis so there is some kind of will which may invest this kind of technology. So my question is how do you make the link and which kind of uh, transition capitalism is doing uh, in uh, this um, uh, toward this kind of uh, technologies. And the, the other question, the, the other point, uh, really, really short, is just, I think it's not so interesting to still speaking about humanity. You know, I would say humanity, human should be, uh, we, we should be deleted from the, from the earth to see because um, the economic crisis or the Anthropocene is not a, huma, an, a, a humanity issue. It's a part of humanity, but we do not share the responsibility at the same level together. Women, indigenous people, they did not participate, in, I th in my opinion, at the same level of the white occidental men in this. Uh, the okay, so we have two uh, quite different aspects here coming up. At the very end, I don't know how far we get with it now, but if you want to give it a try, uh, or else we'll, we might have to go into some more detail uh, at smaller discussions later. So one was about the, the economic system, uh, and the other was about differentiating responsibilities for what's happening in the Anthropocene, I think. Actually, I, I see a strong link between the two questions. Um, if the mindset of the Anthropocene is that it's the human species or man or whatever, uh, then you frame the problems on this generic species level. If you, if you frame that differently like other people like to do, uh, I, I can't pronounce what Dana Haraway calls it, the Stuluzen uh, or the Capitalocene, 
uh, uh, other people, then you would frame it differently. And I would prefer to go the other ways, not frame it like humans are the problem, but specific ways of societal organization is the problem. And then we have to talk about growth societies, uh, consumerist societies, uh, colonial uh, issues, gender issues, and all sorts of things, which I think would get closer to the problem than just talking about anthropos as the human, so far. Would you agree with that, Christopher? Yeah, I, I actually, want, earlier on, I was hoping to sort of get this in there, that, um, that there is a discussion to have about anthropocentrism versus biocentrism or ecocentrism. But almost as soon as you start having that discussion, you've got to follow it up with the other discussion about, is there an anthropos? No. Um, there are a set of, of people living in circumstances with certain worldviews, uh, and some of those are far more destructive than others. Um, so uh, I, I agree with the questioner that it is much more interesting and productive uh, to look more closely at that context. Um, but you know, having said that, the, the uh, advance in Laudato Si uh, to move from anthropocentrism to something else, it is an advance. You know, it, that is something worth paying attention to. I actually think that this last point is so nice, I skipped my last question. <laughs> I'd like to thank the audience for the active participation and the wonderful questions, and I'd like to thank you three, and uh, that was it for now.